the preservation of and increased access to the 92nd Street Y Humanities Audio Archives is generously funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities. Good evening, everyone. I'm Joan Finkelstein. I'm the director of the 92nd Street Y Harkness Dance Center. And it is my pleasure to welcome you here tonight to the first of our second year of Breaking Ground Conversations with Deborah Jowett. You know, the Y had not had dance discussions for many years, really since Walter Terry held them regularly in the 40s and 50s and 60s. And um, the Center for Adult Life and Learning, led by Helene Geismar Katz, had the foresight to see that that dancers and choreographers, especially wonderful choreographers, great choreographers, um, deserved to be listened to as well as watched. So we are very grateful to Helene Geismar Katz and the Center for Adult Life and Learning for making these lectures possible again so that we can hear these people speak about their lives in our field. I am thrilled that Deborah Jowett has agreed once again to host these, these discussions. Uh, many of you know Deborah as a critic with the Village Voice. Her writing for me really was a revelation and opened up dance criticism to analysis and description in a way that it never had before. Uh, Deborah's work, her lifelong work as, as a critic, as a, as a writer, as a teacher, um, and as also a dancer and choreographer, has placed her really in the center of our field, and she's always been a tremendous support to dancers and choreographers, and we're really thrilled again that she can do these lectures for a second year. I'm, uh, I'm not going to say very much about Elliot Feld, because you will see him in a moment, except that he also has been a revelation in the world of ballet, and forged his own path and has a phenomenal company, which has a, a wide audience, has made gorgeous work, and uh, you will hear him speak soon. But first, please help me in welcoming Ms. Deborah Jowett, who will introduce the rest of the evening. Thank you. Before I introduce Elliot Feld, I thought it would be a good idea if we looked at brief excerpts uh, of his work, some of his works on video. You've, some of you have seen what's been playing out in the, in the hall. Uh, Elliot began to choreograph in 1967, and since then he's made, by my count, 83 ballets of extraordinary variety and uh, unusualness. So what we're going to look at is, uh, th they're not introduced, so you'll have to know by a sudden change in the music, <laughs> I think you'll know that you've suddenly switched dances. The first is an excerpt from End Song to the music of Richard, uh, Richard Strauss, that's 1991, and then it will burst into Over the Pavement, a piece with an all-male cast to Charles Ives from 1982, and then go into uh, Charmed Lives, 1990, to Ravel music. And so while you enjoy the excerpts, I will go off stage and be back with Elliot Feld in just a minute. Thank you.
do this. Yes. It's Can you hear me? Um, do you often watch your works on video like that? You seem quite pleased and surprised by some of it. Um, I thought, Darren, you danced beautifully. You're here somewhere. There you are. <laughs> um, I think I heard the music for End Song, which is ma what made me want to uh, come and watch it. Uh -huh. um, because the music still moves me. Um, but no, I d generally don't watch them. Because they look, you know, they look very different sometimes watching your own works on video. They, they sort of look enervated compared with the way they look on stage. The weight goes away or something. They look floatier. Yeah, well, I mean, the screen has no gravity. So, mm -hmm. you know, you can be anywhere on the screen at any point that, without any labor. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Ask the dancers. Um, I, was, I was thinking about seeing pictures of you in many, many years ago in productions that I, what I never saw you in. As a child, in Pearl Lang's Joy is My Witness, perched on somebody's right. shoulders. Right. Actually, it was rights. It was rights. Yeah. Rights. <laughs> and right. as, the, as the little prince in Nutcracker. So that here you were, at, you know, in Balanchine's. New York City Ballet as a child star and uh, and in a modern dance and I wondered if those two I mean those two strains sort of persisted in your background because you went to performing arts mm -hmm. right you studied modern dance and ballet do you think that there's some sort of influence of, of uh, modern dance in the way you thought of your company the way you structured your career in any way well I think that right early on there was some sense that uh, uh, that neither the ballet nor the modern dance had everything neither one was mm -hmm. adequate mm -hmm. for what I for what I felt mm -hmm. so I kept switching back and forth it feels too loud I kept switching back and forth from ballet to modern at the high school of performing arts mm -hmm. um, I think it was a kind of uh, a presentiment of, of my continued concern with trying to in some way find that which I adored about each of those kinds of dancing. Mm -hmm. And when you actually started your own company, which would be what, 1969 around then? Yes, my first company. First company. And uh, you'd been in, in ballet theater as a dancer and you'd done your first choreography there and then you struck out and started your own company. <laughs> That's true. Some people would say exactly that. <laughs> and then he struck out. Well, there you go. <laughs> Critics, um, they're all the same. <laughs> uh, in doing that... <laughs> <laughs> go on, Debbie. Go Sorry. on. Don't, don't get tense. No, all right. <laughs> uh, in doing that, it seems to me that the company, that you really were comporting yourself rather more like the modern dance choreographers than ballet, that is, even though you had some works in the repertory uh, by other people yes. occasionally, it was your company with your choreography, you were the director, you were the choreographer, the founder, and occasionally the dancer. So that it mm -hmm. seems to me that that was less like the way most ballet companies are structured. I mean, even Balanchine, you know, it, he is the exclu was the, almost the exclusive choreographer, but he wasn't. He didn't have all the headaches that you had. In True. And he didn't dance too. <laughs> um, so I thought, in some way, modern dance may have had some influence. In other words, the company seemed more like a modern dance company than but a I ballet think, company in structure. But I think it seemed that way. Be I mean, at its heart, because it was primarily concerned with the work of a single choreographer, right. myself in yes, this case. Right. Um, I think that that's that that is true. And it was small in scale. It well, was it was ex that you know dancers have to eat and they need yeah. roofs, so it didn't seem so small to me. Um, no. Come Thursday when it's payday. Right. Um, you see, you had to worry about that kind of thing. Yeah, but everybody has to worry yeah. about that. I mean, you know, there weren't the good old days when we used to dance here. Yeah, um, not here, but well, downstairs, here, somewhere right. here. Yeah. Um, I mean, you know, the, I, I saw last night, I saw Anna Sokolow and Pearl Lang. I mean, I danced for those women happily, mm -hmm. and we never got paid. I mean, I danced with you. We right. never got we, paid. We never got paid. Um, this is but, when he was a teenager. Yes, and so were you. Yes, um, well. <laughs> but I, I assume that those choreographers had terrible headaches, too. I mean, I'm sure you they know, did, the, yeah. the inability to pay people is quite a headache. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. 
But you wanted to go that way. You didn't want to work within the framework of a ballet company. Why well, was that? I think that I felt that uh, that the work shouldn't be answerable to anything but the work. And when somebody is paying the bills, which in a ballet company that means somebody else is paying the bills, um, there's a certain degree of control which one must relinquish. Their, their ambitions are not your ambitions. They have another uh, uh, entity to take care of, a ballet company. That's appropriate. They have a ballet company. You are one piece, however important or unimportant, in that world. Mm -hmm. um, and I felt that to be uh, uh, onerous in terms of what I was forced to relinquish. Now, some people may have said, you know, you're crazy. I mean, it was only a little bit that you were forced to relinquish. Um, but it felt like a lot to me. Mm -hmm. um, I just didn't see why anybody should tell me who should dance in the ballet or when it should, what it should be paired with, you know. I mean, I think I left ballet theater uh, uh, when we went to Los Angeles and at midnight, which is a rather dark ballet, had its premiere in Los Angeles on a matinee paired with Giselle. So it opened up the program um, on a Sunday matinee um, at two o'clock in the afternoon with yeah. Giselle. You know, I thought, I gotta get out of here. This is no good. Yeah, and you also yeah. have to fight for rehearsal time. You're in the middle yeah. of rehearsal and somebody comes and takes one of your dancers and says, I'm sorry, she has to look, work on this pas de deux Whatever. somewhere else. But actually, in, in, an, in another way, uh, also, uh, I mean, uh, let me clarify this. I, I didn't leave in a fit of pique thinking that Lucia screwed me. I mean, I just thought, this is no good. I want a kind of freedom that only the only responsibility will give me that kind of freedom. I've got to give, I had to give something up to get what I felt was essential for me to do my work. Mm -hmm. um, and and I, that's a bargain that each of us makes in our lives according to our nature. Um, and while I certainly regret, like most of us do, not being able to have everything I wanted all of the time, um, that's how it is. Um, and I'm very, I'm quite content with the bargain that I made. Well, I'm content. Good. <laughs> uh, That's two of it's a beginning. <laughs> did, you, did you feel um, any kind of burden when you first started to work that way to, to create a, a varied repertory the way I, I even think Balanchine sometimes did? Uh, you know, that now I must make a light work, now I must make a dark work, now I'll make a contemporary work, now mm -hmm. I need to do this? I think that, that uh, Mr. Balanchine was a much more pragmatic mm -hmm. fellow. Um, I think also in part, um, and I, I don't mean this in any way pejoratively, he, he, it was easy for him. I mean, he, could, he would do a ballet in two, three days. I, I mean, it was just easy. Mm -hmm. um, and so he, I, I think that his body of work reflects the ease with which mm -hmm. he was able to choreograph. I, I, I think that I may have uh, uh, responded, but only as one needs a variety in one's diet, mm -hmm. so that if I if I did something that was very dark or whatever, mm -hmm. I would s gravitate towards something that had a quality of an entremet, mm -hmm. um, because one needs some variety, or I felt I needed mm -hmm. some variety, but it wasn't out of uh, a sense that, oh, I need to do this for the program. Or, it was for yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Because I look back at that this repertory list, you know, where in the 70s where you would do intermezzo, which is so romantic and so lush uh, emotionally and musically, and then you did, remember Pagan Spring? I do. All squats and uh, <laughs> <laughs> flexed feet, and, and you did uh, Cortege Parisienne, which was one of those bouquets, and mm -hmm. then you did, and you did um, Tzadik, which was an unusual for a ballet company, drawing on, on uh, Jewish roots. Uh, and I, I, I was amazed by the variety, and I mm -hmm. didn't know whether it was a, a conscious thing on your part. And, and no, it was not conscious. Mm -hmm. Just that, let me try something different. Go or, ahead. Yeah, or like, like <laughs> oh, me, I no, see. No, you, no. Got it. Like, like, like that. You try something different yeah, now, right. too, right? Uh, do you think that over, I mean, I'm sure this is, I mean, this is obvious, but over those years since the 70s, how have, has, has your idea about what you're doing in ballet gone through some kinds of changes? 
Well, I, I, this is a question I'm asked with some frequency, um, and I'm not really sure. I think that, uh, well, I've done more work to American music, mm -hmm. because early on I did almost, mm -hmm. almost nothing to American music. Um, I think the Reich ballets were very important in my, uh, uh, my, my using groups especially, my sense of form. Mm -hmm. um, I, I always had a problem uh, uh, using large groups of people um, because it felt, I, the, the models were all uh, uh, essentially European 19th century mm -hmm. and I was very uncomfortable. Um, I just felt that I was an imposter in this world. I mean, mm -hmm. I was born in Brooklyn, you know, I wasn't born in Leningrad and although I, I appreciate the ballets, that, that have come from that tradition. Um, they weren't me. I mean, you know, I, I, I used to sing with Dion and the Belmonts, you know, <laughs> shoo do shoo be do. I, uh, so I think that the Reich ballets, uh, uh, the music, which, which by the way, I detested for about three years of listening. I just kept trying. I kept saying, you're a reactionary. Elliot, you know, 35 and you're over the hill. So I, I worked very hard to find out what it, what it was in the music that was engaging. And uh, it happened for me quite suddenly. I was able to relinquish my predilection for needing some kind of arc to a piece or some kind of development that, always, that had seemed essential for me. And then once I did that, a whole series of ballets, um, letting form develop over time without the imposition of narrative, mm -hmm. um, seemed possible and desirable and wonderful. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that those, those, the Auroras and another ballet, Bent Plains, um, and even the Grand Canon, uh, really permitted me to begin working in point ballets with larger groups because I found how I could do it and be me, to be myself in some way. Mm -hmm and not simply imitating petty power or Balanchine. Mm -hmm. or, it's a problem that Tudor had. I mean, mm -hmm. Tudor never, never did that. I mean, he never dealt with that problem. He just said, I don't want to deal with that problem, and, mm -hmm. and never did. Oh, I, Robin said, too, once, and you worked with Robin, so you yes. know him better than I, that he didn't like working with a large ensemble because it was hard for him to keep focused on the humanity of each dancer, which seemed to interest him very much, that they disappeared into a faceless crowd and then he didn't want to have anything to do with it. Yeah, I mean, we we're, we're, we're come from a more egalitarian society mm -hmm. um, where, where people are not supposed to be kind of anonymous folk. Mm -hmm. um, I think that that's part of it. Mm -hmm. I think that that's part of it. Why, what, made you start with Reich, Steve, with Steve Reich's very repetitive, uh, well, they're repetitive, but they, they build within themselves in very subtle ways so that they're not simply staying in one place, but that you certainly are hearing things over, develop very minimally over a long period of time. You sound as if it was in some ways a, a Spartan diet for you. Why did you decide, I mean, what made you decide you had to make yourself do this? Well, I didn't, I, 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 I was really concerned that I was a reactionary. I mean, I, I, I was listening to this new music and I was thinking, my God, what, what am I not, how am I not accessible to this? What is it about this music that, uh, uh, that seems to be reaching a chord among people who are alive today? Um, <laughs> Well, and Laura, and Laura Dean had had some success uh, working with that kind of structure in the modern but days. But I wasn't concerned. I was concerned with what was the music going to make me feel. I mean, I didn't care what Laura did. No, I mean, I, I mean, wish her the best. No, but, but I mean, it had. There was there was a sense that people were using this music to dance. Yeah, to. I mean, I, yeah. I I'm telling you, I was concerned that I was. You were behind. Behind. Yeah. I, so I kept listening, and s at some point. There was an, an ecstasy in the music that became apparent mm -hmm, to me. Mm -hmm. I mean, not apparent intellectually, I felt it. Mm -hmm. I felt it. There was something about the confusion of the upbeats and the downbeats, because it's one of the devices he uses, um, where you don't know where the downbeat is. I mean, 
European music tends to have the accent on the downbeat. You know, it's why square people snap like that, and people who are familiar with jazz snap. <laughs> and Steve does both, and then after a while, you don't know where you are, and it has a quality of beginning to take off and hover mm -hmm. and a kind of elation um, mm -hmm. that I had not been open to. And then suddenly I was, and the music had an ecstasy and a magic. Mm -hmm. um, and, and you heard that in the music before yeah. you even began to choreograph. Well, wondering of course. Why would I choreograph if I well, didn't? I mean, I would Because wouldn't. you felt you, well, you, you've never just felt you, you would do it to try it and then you would have to well, love I would distinguish first. between a labor and a labor of yeah, love. Right. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, it seems to me that there was something happening uh, even before then. I remember talking to you because I was doing a um, writing a piece about you in about 75 when you were making Mazurka. Oh, you she wrote the most beautiful review of the ballet. It's a wonderful review. Uh, and excursions and you were talking that time about, and I, I don't want to misquote you, but you can, so you can say what that that you felt that a certain kind of romanticism was too easy for you. It wasn't pleasing anymore. It was it wasn't astringent enough, the kind of thing you'd been doing with at midnight and interme and intermezzo, felt somehow, I don't know, gooey to you or something. And you 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 were using Chopin music for Mazurka. But it seemed to me you thought you were uh, trying to get something else out of that. Well, I think that uh, uh, a certain adolescent quality of, about uh, one's attitude about love. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, one experiences life. Um, and although at the center one may be the same person, um, time tends to rotate you or you so that you appreciate different aspects of of the same imperative, mm -hmm. um, and I think that uh, I mean I, I don't think that I could do intermezzo now. I mean I think if you see end song, end song is my intermezzo now. I mean I, I'm I'm 52. I'm faced with uh, uh, my own mortality, my inability to dance any longer, mm -hmm. um, with the generation of dancers that are not no longer my peers there. 16, 18, 25, 30. Mm -hmm. um, so I can't, I can't look at it much as I might like to look at it the same way, much as I rail that things have changed. Um, they have changed. Mm -hmm. And I think that, that that's what's reflected in that. It's not that I want to be more astringent. It's that astringency comes with, uh, you know, time makes mm -hmm. one astringent. Look at how we get drawn. <laughs> yeah. Just how it is. <laughs> I uh, do, do you, um, it, it seems to me that what you said about the Reich uh, music, that those pieces all clustered together, that you have become interested, uh, not that there still isn't a lot of variety in the repertory, but I feel that you have allowed yourself now the pleasure of working hmm. more the way painters would work in a series. That is, if an idea, uh, like like the Aurora pieces mm -hmm. that used Reich music and used um, structural mm -hmm. things on stage, uh, marvelous slides and barricades that the dancers had to work on, and the audience had to be cold because if the dancers sweat too much, they couldn't manage on the platforms. <laughs> right. <laughs> Speaking of that, um, but to work. To, to, that seems to me a, um, <laughs> a, a, um, something that you, you have permitted yourself, that is to explore an idea in its various permutations, the way somebody like Ad Reinhardt did black paintings for a while. Uh, because I see that not just in the Reich, but for instance, your, your, your interest in the, the uh, early 20th century French composers like Ravel, mm -hmm. Um, Satie, uh, Debussy, mm -hmm. and and what that music led you to, those pieces seem to me to be related, like exploring another side of the mm -hmm. same same idea. I, I think that you're right, but it's certainly not conscious. I mean, it's it's not. just no. I think it's whatever. I, I 
whatever moves me. Mm -hmm. I mean, what music moves me. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't really, I mean, I don't mean, I hope it doesn't sound disingenuous, but I, I really feel as though the music picks me. Um, I don't make, I make very few decisions. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, you know, if, if, if Debussy warms up your ears for Ravel, I, that seems quite logical. Yeah. That if you do, and and it, uh, but you do you, you you never, in those works you never I I, had the idea the design ideas that I think I see in them, which is that they relate to, um, the Diaghilev ballets, which use those composers like Afternoon of a Fawn mm -hmm. or Scheherazade, and I see somehow in your in those works of yours, a, a kind of very contemporary abstraction of ideas like fawn. Mm -hmm. I certainly see that the solo for Darren, or, is that way, or the you know the ori the odalisks mm -hmm. who are dancing there. Did you make that connection, or did that all just come out of the music? No, I, I tend to steal inadvertently. I, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> I'm in deep denial. I, I, I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, I just do what I do, and, and I, I clearly everything has a genesis. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't really care to analyze where it can. I want to move on. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, I, I did it, and I, I, I think that a lot of what you say must be so. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not particularly well educated in terms of dance history, so, but it could come from a picture. Mm -hmm. It could come from hearing my ballet teacher say something and seeing a shape, and then one imagines from that. I, I don't really know, but I, I mean, nothing springs from nothing. Um, and so I think your guess as to what mm -hmm. the root is is probably pretty good. I think a lot of very of, of choreographers of great imagination work that way, something something they see, something they hear, you know, without thinking, oh, I must do an approximation of this, or wouldn't it be clever if I, I mean, there are some choreographers who do that, but others who, who don't, who just let the music feed them, or something they've seen, or, you know, like, who would have thought Balanchine's uh, Bugaku would be so little like Bugaku, and so much like some kind of Japanese erotic art that he obviously was looking at in his spare time. <laughs> Japanese uh, people are very surprised that, that he thought that had anything to do with Bugaku beside the look of the stage. Um, do, do you think, I mean this is, a, this is one of those dumb questions to try to get an interesting answer. Uh, <laughs> do you think of yourself as having a style that that persists through all your works? No, uh, I, I mean, for me, uh, I, I, I feel as though each piece of music um, should be dealt with um, particularly, um, and that what was right for one dance was to another piece of music of another um, another way of moving, another, other devices, other formal devices, in terms of its musical construction, mm -hmm. the, the music itself. Mm -hmm. um, and I try to find out what is appropriate mm -hmm. for the present relationship. Mm -hmm. um, I, I feel that I do that better in, in art than in life. <laughs> <laughs> I think you do. I think I, I think that's true. How do you know? True. How do I know? Um, I think you do that too. But I I was thinking that if I saw, if I was out in Tashkent, or somewhere, or maybe Iowa. I don't know. Somewhere. It's almost the same. <laughs> and I stumbled upon a stage that I'd never seen before in a theater I'd never seen before and there was a ballet going on and it was yours I would know it was yours and there are a lot of choreographers particularly in the ballet that I couldn't say that about that I wouldn't see the work and say there's only one mind that puts movement together this mm -hmm. way and so I think even though you do 
work differently in response to different music. I think there's something, there are things about you that, that are, are there all the time. Um, I don't know, it seems to me you're very interested in, in, in quite a few ballets in intricacy, in, in, in body parts that um, approach each other in extremely complex ways, mm -hmm. you know, or cl close to the body shapes. You know, we think of ballet as being so open and so linear, and often I f feel that you subvert that by arms that wrap or arms that wrap, uh, mm -hmm. you know, and that... But I, I think that this is, uh, uh, this ballet and modern business, going back to that original mm -hmm. point, um, I think that people, I think the difference between ballet and modern, I mean, the essential difference um, is that ballet movement tends to go out from the center, reaching this way, and modern dance is centripetal, while ba ballet dancing tends to be centrifugal. Mm -hmm. One's force is going out, the other's force is coming in. And I think what you see is the competition, um, and I, I, I mean, I think that that's true. I, mm -hmm. I, I feel similarly mm -hmm. about the work, um, that those two forces, the centrifugal and the centripetal, are in contention for dominance. Mm -hmm. um, and, and depending on the temperament of the work, one will be more assertive and more victorious mm -hmm. um, than another. But I think that that is a, a great tension. It is the great metaphor, um, a useful metaphor. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're, talking, we're not talking about doing everyday things to tell a story, we're, we're talking about metaphor. Mm -hmm. Well, this is the great, one of the great contests mm -hmm. of, the, of the human body. But even within ballet, you, you have that because one of the most basic things in ballet dancing um, is when you, when you do a dégagé with your, with your leg, you, have, you feel your instep pushing one way and the thigh pulling up the other way. So even within any given movement, you have those two kind of opposing Things. I mean, you have this tension between right. between muscles in competition That's with one true. another. That's what makes dancers physical. But in that case, they're both working on a, a, a stretching task, like opposition stretching. Yes, they're both actually stretching. trying to go different ways. Yeah, but I mean, I yes, I, I see that. It's not perfect. Yeah, you know, hey, but I, I. It's an idea. Uh, <laughs> it's an idea. And, um, and it's also true. <laughs> which I value a, a lot, that I, I feel that you avoid um, those elements of ballet that are conventionally virtuosic. That is, people leap and people turn and people do extraordinarily difficult things. But I never feel as if they plant themselves and say, as if to say to the audience, watch it, a pirouette is coming. Or, uh, you know, now for the fouettes, that you seem to, you're the, you seem to drive the flow past those conventional show-off patterns. You don't seem to like those at all. Yeah. Fuetes. <laughs> but do you ever do that sometimes? I really haven't for a very long time. Yeah. Uh, uh, it seems to me that, that what interests me about turning is to show the facets of the body. Um, spinning feels more like a trick. I love to spin as a dancer. I mean, when I was, when I was in class or... Um, I, I loved it. There was something exhilarating about it. But I find it of no interest to me choreographically um, because everything has to stop while this thing that we already know happens. Um, turning, and he, can, he or she can turn longer and more, and, and there it is. Oh, and I've seen it at this company and that dancer. And I don't know. It, seems, it doesn't seem much different than a, a monkey and an organ grinder in some way. Mm -hmm. um, I'd like to entertain you, by which I, I mean to keep your interests. Um, but there are prices I'm not willing to pay. Yeah. <laughs> yes, right. <laughs> Cheap tricks, right? Well, yeah. I mean, I, I like them, but th I don't. Th they're not useful expressive devices for me. Mm -hmm. And for me, dancing is essentially an, a, a tool for expression. Um, yeah, that's what I was going to ask. Yeah. At, that is the way you see dancing. I, I think that I, I, more than I see it, I feel it that mm -hmm. way. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I, I, when I go to a ballet company, I'll often think, we're not in the same profession. I mean, I don't do this, mm -hmm. you know. I mean, it's not, 
I, I don't even feel kindred to it. Mm -hmm. um, it's odd, it's, it's mm -hmm. odd. and it's, it's gotten more so. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, I think your work has pulled more and more away from that in mm -hmm. some way. Uh, what about um, dancers, the, da uh, the dancers that you are attracted to, to the, at an audition, when people come for your company? Um, what, is it, what is it about certain people that you like? Well, the, the auditions are based on ballet because it's a language that's common, so mm -hmm. you, you can quickly teach somebody to see to what extent they have gained mm -hmm. accomplishment, mm -hmm. technical accomplishment. Um, there's a, you know, dancing really has to do with the, uh, uh, the harmony of the limbs in space. Um, they call it line, mm -hmm. um, but it's the harmony of the limbs in space. Um, and good dancers have their own harmony. Mm -hmm. the, the package makes sense. They're, somehow the the chords are true. Mm -hmm. the, the intonations are honest and right. It doesn't mean they look like any of their peers necessarily, but to my eye, uh, it, it is harmonious in some way. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a very subjective, very personal. I mean, it feels like fact, mm -hmm. but I know that since everybody doesn't agree with me, it must not necessarily be fact. Um, so I, I really look for that kind of uh, uh, harmony of the limbs mm -hmm. in counterpoint. Mm -hmm. and, and the extent to which through movement they it stays melodic. Um, and it's just an instinct that dancers have. I mean, something you cannot teach. And you can't learn at an audition, by the way. So you do the best you can at an audition. And then we teach people uh, steps from ballets. But it's really not until somebody's been with the company for some period of mm -hmm. time that you begin to understand uh, the affinity you have for their mm -hmm. sense of motion. Mm -hmm. You, you haven't done very much work with guest artists or stars, and it seems to me that, that uh, the idea of an ensemble of equals, who any, uh, any one of whom could step into an important role, even though you have featured certain dancers, is something about the star that displeases you. I don't know. Uh, I mean, I, don't, I think that uh, within the, any company that I've had, there's, there's an appropriate hierarchy. Yeah. Those who bear the burden of responsi mm -hmm. greater responsibility mm -hmm. and those who mm -hmm. don't. And that has to do with my appraisal of their talents. <laughs> um, I, 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 I like stars. You like stars. At night. <laughs> um, it's, it has seemed to me that um, looking at your dancers over the years that uh, You've liked a kind of, um, I don't know, simplicity, not putting on manners, not putting on uh, uh, too much attention getting, you know, that, that it's much simpler, it's much through the, more through the movement that you want them to perform. I think for the most part, I think that, uh, that the ballet is, the ballets that I do are, uh, things that would go on irrespective of them being viewed. They're mm -hmm. autonomous. Mm -hmm. um, really? Even when nobody's watching them? Like the tree that's falling in the forest? Is, they're, they're, they're going on whether we're looking at them or not? It got too deep for me. Um, <laughs> yeah, they're, they're autonomous. I, I mean, I, they're there to be, to be witnessed and to be shared. Um, but they're not performed for you. I mean, as, as I am distinct from you, I mean, I, I want you to like me, but I'm not about to, you know, I, I mean, I, I, I need to be me, and the ballets need to be themselves. Mm -hmm. um, I think that that's elementary. It just seems elementary. I've never seen a work that I had esteem for that I felt uh, 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 asked me to like it. Mm -hmm. It's, it's offensive to me. Mm -hmm. It's offensive to see something that asks to be liked. Mm 
Mm -hmm. There's an absence of conviction and necessity to exist that I find truly offensive. I agree. <laughs> okay. <laughs> But being a critic, I can't say so. I understand. I'm, I'm here. Right. I'm just your surrogate. I understand. Uh, however, I, I, I do think that you get an extraordinary performance quality out of your dancers. And I've seen you work with them on and off. I'm, I'm not sure how you do it. You don't seem to totally drive them crazy. Uh, but, Darren. Uh, but you get a real full, a, a sort of finesse in performing that one doesn't see very often. Sometimes in Robin's works where you feel that it's performed exactly the way he wants it performed and no other way. But in many companies you see a kind of, I don't know, it looks as if this dancer doesn't really understand the movement and that dancer understands it but doesn't have a sense of the space and in, in your dances, it looks always to me as if every dancer understands how this is supposed to be on the body and what this work is all about. How do you get that? Or maybe I you don't think really you work really hard. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I mean, uh, it helps when people are there when you choreograph things mm -hmm. um, because it is not yet an artifact. So they see the impulse that makes the steps. Um, the minute a ballet gets to a second generation, it might as well be 100 years old. It doesn't really matter. They, were, they didn't witness the process. So for them, they always they think that these are the steps the way they were always the steps. But they weren't. And only the people that were there, even we forget. I mean, I forget. The, the dancers, we, yeah. for, we forget. Sometimes we'll look, we're, we're reviving over the pavement now. Um, and we looked at some very early things. The company went to, to California to do Song of Norway with City Opera, and I, I didn't go. And I stayed behind with the dancer, Edmund LaFosse, and we worked for about two weeks just on movement. Um, and so at the end of the two weeks, the company came back, and on the last day, we videotaped the movement that I had been working on to the Ives music. And uh, we looked at it a, a few weeks ago, and it was all con just pieces of movement and I forgot, I mean, it was some movement to different pieces of music and things combined. Um, and I, for, I had forgotten the process because it had actually become an artifact for me. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that the, the dancers who were there originally, because even though it gets more distant, it is nevertheless vestigial. It's, mm -hmm. it's there, um, that information. Um, but for other dancers, and, and for the choreographer as well, especially as you get older and can't move as much, so your muscles don't have the memory. Um, what was the question? <laughs> well, I've forgotten. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> no, it, um, but do you, have you videoed a lot of the, of the works? I mean, you, you do have them on video. You have that resource? Yes, that's, that is the only uh, uh, mechanism for what, recording the yeah, ballads yeah. That, that, I, that I have. I, I don't really, I mean, I don't read lab annotation or Benish, mm -hmm. and in fact, I don't really believe in it. Mm -hmm. um, it you, suggests that there's a definitive version. Yeah, I was going to say, do you mind that things change? I mean, I was just looking out there on the video um, and noticed that the solo in the consort. Different. It's different. Yeah. I think I like the earlier one better. Me too. Darren, we're trying to go back. We are. We've it actually had, been working on it. It had a crossing in the body that was more interesting. Well, this is much more balletic. Yes. Th it, absolutely. It's a real corruption. I agree. But it, no, I, I, abs I do agree. And, 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 and it's a kind of a, a slight tawdry aspect in my nature that I'm faced with when I see that. Yeah. Because the public tends to prefer the more bravura. Mm -hmm. And I think that I kind of got sucked into it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, for some reason I always remember that. In fact, I think I stole from it once when I was doing. That's probably why I remember. Maybe that's it so why well. I lost it. <laughs> I was doing a, a a musical comedy, and I. <laughs> oh, thanks. <laughs> no, it was a very feelingful musical I comedy. I bet. <laughs> uh, and so I, I really, I had just seen that ballet, and the, you know, the thing sort of must have gotten into me anyway. Um, <laughs> 
Talk about the school a little bit because this is seen as a very important part of your mm -hmm. enterprise. Well, when we built our studios on 19th Street in 1976, I think it was, um, we had wonderful space, four enormous studios. Um, and it's always difficult to find wonderful dancers and I thought I really need to have a school because the, the exigencies of having an audition and hoping you find somebody that will be wonderful or useful or adequate, I mean it's, you know, it's hit or miss and it's always a problem, was always a problem mm -hmm. for me. Um, and so we started a school in the traditional way, you know, we took out an ad we, and there was not really any talent that attended class. Um, and after about, I don't know, a couple of months, I thought, this is pointless. This is, this is going nowhere. And we stopped the school. And uh, I used to live on 79th Street. And on the subway to work one day, um, there were a group of children, elementary school children, on a field trip. They were so, they were making, wreaking havoc in the car of the train. They were so excited to be going somewhere. And I thought, there must be you know, hundreds of thousands of children in the elementary schools of New York that have no opportunity to find out if they're gifted or are interested in dancing. Why don't we look for talent in the public schools? And so we began um, with the cooperation of the Board of Education. Um, and I think the first year we were in Georgia, I don't remember, 13 schools or something like that. Is that right? Um, if I get it very wrong, Georgia, say something. Um, and uh, we took a hundred and some odd children and they were bused to us one day a week. Um, and over the, and, and, oh, it's hard to give a feeling of this. What happened is that uh, uh, the exposure was wonderful for the children um, and I think that it still is wonderful. I mean, to come to a place mm -hmm. in a big space with a grand piano with mirrors where it's just you and your body. I mean, the subject is your body. Um, not, it's not the subject of somebody else's choice, like math or history. Or, I mean, you're the subject. That's mm -hmm. what's wonderful about dancing. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that, that whether the children continued or not was, had a big influence on their understanding of what learning might be, that mm -hmm. it had something to do with self. Mm -hmm. um, and over the years, uh, Darren came, I think, in the second or third year, mm -hmm. Darren Gibson, mm -hmm. one of my leading dancers, leading dancer of the company and ballet master, and now he's on the board of directors, actually. Really? So he started from a school in Queens at age 10, and at 20-something, he's now all of that. Um, but the, the school has not uh, literally fed the company. Mo uh, your dancers have not all come out of Well, I think, no, no, they have not. But right. what we discovered over years, because there's no model for this kind of school, so each year we would, in a sense, try to reinvent that which we felt was not adequate, sufficient. Mm -hmm. um, and what became clear to me, it took about 10 years for it to become clear, was that it was a wonderful idea, but that in terms of creating dancers year after year, that each class, each level would have several dancers. Mm -hmm. um, in it, that the scale was wrong, um, that the idea was right, but the scale was wrong. And so about five or six years ago, we, we increased the, uh, uh, the number of children auditioned and the number of children selected. Um, and uh, we're in the first year, we were in 13 schools. Last year, we were in over 300 schools. We went to 265 new schools and auditioned 66,000 children um, and selected over 1,000 children. With, in, in, with the prospect that five years, four or five years from the time they first came, there would be a class of 15 or 20 or 25 very gifted dancers mm -hmm. at that level. Th this year, and, and that's, I mean, we didn't, we didn't go from 3,000 to 66,000, but we went from to 12 to 18 to 25 mm -hmm. to 37 and, and to this, this number. And in, in the course of those years, there are now five or six dancers that are entering the company from the school. Mm -hmm. So it's starting to happen, and as, as we look back at the, the levels, you know, 15-year-olds, 14, 13, you can see that there are dancers in each, each level. Mm -hmm. um, Maybe we should take some questions from the audience. Sure. Okay? 
I wish we could have house lights. That's yeah, great. Yeah, they are. Yes. Um, yeah, I mean, we, we, we have ballet class, and it's ballet class. Oh, I wouldn't presume. <laughs> I mean, you know, ballet class is, it's, uh, uh, it's the antidote to choreography, in a way, because choreography uh, uh, has uh, uh, its predilections, its affinities, its obsessions, and ballet class is the great neutralizer, placing you... S reminding you of the perpendicular, um, doing some of the absolute essential geometry that the body needs to stay healthy um, and to be well trained so that people like me can distort it. But the, but the, advanced, true, student, I, the advanced students have had a chance sometimes to learn some of your repertory and you made a lovely little ballet for a group of students so they do get to experience his style not in the daily class. Yeah, no, they do. I mean, they, they have to, they have to, that ballet dancing is very, uh, uh, it's so rigorous that unless you remind people that dancing is still about dancing, uh, you can have a perfectly well-trained person who has no idea of what dancing is. So it's, you have to kind of mix the diet so that the full person develops. Uh, Any other questions? You're kidding. <laughs> yes. It just took that. You're kidding. <laughs> Here's one over here. <laughs> oh. Um, well, I, I joined West Side Story on Broadway, and then I did the movie of West Side Story, and then I thought I wanted to be an actor um, because my experience in the movies was that they got more attention and made more money. Um, and I was right, they, they do get more attention and they do make more money, but I was not a gifted actor. Um, and then I kind of dropped out from dancing and from acting, and I played ping pong for two years, um, from about 11 a.m. till 6 in the morning. Um, and then I, I started to go back to dancing just because I was very bored. Um, and I started studying with Richard Thomas just to stay busy, just to get out of the ping pong parlor. Um, and he really, I never thought I would be in a ballet company. I mean, it was a weird idea to be in a ballet company. Um, and he kind of said, well, I'll just go and audition for ballet theater. And I did audition, and they didn't take me. And then I really, <laughs> that did it. So I was hooked. Just reject me once. And I'm a sucker. <laughs> but I, do, I think that's sort of a, uh, it's a myth about dancers not being particularly articulate. And I think that. It's, no, it's not. It's also. A, <laughs> well, no, I'm sorry. I think it's also a myth that you get more articulate by going to college. Mm. Uh, I think that there are people who um, are born talkers and and uh, smart people. Uh, you know. That's right, and they deserve no credit for it. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else? Yes, back there. No, I, I never have because I would have no, I've never had a, a feeling to make a dance except through the impulse that, of the music. Um, and so I wouldn't know how to do it. I mean, I, I did once speak to uh, Aaron Copeland because I had, uh, I love bluegrass music, but I never could find bluegrass music that I wanted to make a dance to. And I thought it seems like something that he would have, you know, to do a concerto for fiddle based on bl a bluegrass idea because um, I'm you know partly long hair partly not um, and I also had an idea uh, I have never done it but I'm telling you all the ideas I haven't done I had an idea uh, uh, and I never did speak to him because I can't get him on the phone um, to do a shaker ballet um, and have S Steve Reich do music because some of the instrumentation and the symmetry of shaker ritual and mm -hmm. his music and the ecstasy that they both seek I, I somehow uh, but in answer to your question no I haven't because the music always comes first 
I think it's possible, but it's a, it's it's sort of buying a pig in a poke, even if it's a composer you, you right. greatly admire, to say, write me something that I can make a ballet to, because it might not come out in a way that would inspire you. Yeah, I, you know, I think that that technology has changed. I mean, people couldn't listen to music except uh, uh, when there was no phonograph, no radio, no CDs. I mean, people, they needed a, a person there playing music, so the whole relationship to music... Um, was very different, and to composers was very different. Mm -hmm. um. Anybody else? Yes. Nothing is everything I've hoped for. How about you? <laughs> <laughs> Georgia, please. Yeah, it's it's true that, uh, uh, and I, I, actually, it it's an interesting point. Uh, it, the teachers for the early levels, especially the beginners and the first year students, um, they just need to have magic. I mean, they need to have magic. They need to be Pied Pipers so that the children follow. I mean, these children didn't come to us saying, I want to be a dancer. I mean, I knew I wanted to be a dancer. I went to the School of American Ballet, and I studied with Madame Timkovsky, and I didn't understand a word she was saying. She terrorized me, but I wanted to please her because I wanted to be a dancer. Um, these, these children, 80%, about 80% of, of whom are minority because the public school system is 80% minority, um, they don't know that they want to be dancers. They went to an audition because we came to their school. Um, so they didn't know what they were getting into. So the burden is slightly different for the new ballet school, which is to show the children what dancing is so that should there be an incipient passion within them and a gift, that that has a chance to reveal itself and for them to get hooked, um, which is not to say that the classes are not disciplined, because they are, but the approach is slightly different because the premise is different. They come to us differently than most children who go to ballet class because they want to and they know what it is. Do they get, do many of them get hooked? Maybe not as far as getting into your company, but do they, do, do you notice a lot of them getting kind of hooked on dancing that this might be something that they could do with their lives? Oh yeah, I mean that, that clearly happens. Mm -hmm. But I mean, the, the, there's a kind of mutual attrition. I mean, if we'll have, a, a, this semester we'll have 600, 600 beginners, by the summer there'll be 250. Um, by the fall there'll be 170. By the following summer there'll be 90. I mean, there's a kind of, it, it, it does itself in a, in, a, in a funny way. You get a lot of boys, which is very good. The school this. is about three to one boys to girls. It is absolutely amazing. There was, last, last year there were almost 700 male beginners and 330 girls. I mean, it's amazing. His auditioners. <laughs> well, I keep saying, did we get any girls today? Did we get any girls today? Um, I think that that's so. I think that, that uh, I think it may have to do with the fact that, that Boys are more athletic, um, and so their bodies tend to be more trim and therefore offer hope. Um, I think it also has to do with uh, uh, point dancing, which is so terribly unforgiving for women um, and the nature of their foot. Um, it's not any, it's just, a, it's just a, a rigor that men, I mean, men, you know, you can have an ugly foot. It's okay, and you can learn to make it disappear. A too refined a foot on a man is not so attractive anyway, in my estimation. Um, 
but I think that that may be that may be part I of it. I think the process is also part of it because if you take the average um, New York City schoolboy and you say to him, "Would you like to take ballet lessons?" Uh, the idea of of venturing out to do that, uh, paying the money, and all that is is one thing. But if somebody comes in your school and says, "Hey, everybody, you can come and audition, and if you get it, this is an honor and it's free." It, it's not such a, you know, it's not such a burden. Mm -hmm. I, I, are you aware that the school is tuition free, so that nobody pays anything and they get their clothes and their shoes and everything else? Yes. Uh, somebody over here. Yeah. We do. Um, mostly, it's foundations. Um, there's very little government money. Um, there's almost no board of education money. Um, so it's, it's foundations and individuals. And I, I mean, I must say I regard the company and the school as one. So we'll deny the company something if it, I mean, it's just one, it's one enterprise there. It's just, I, we regard it as one enterprise. Um, so last year it was, I think, $836,000. Yeah. Uh, Angelica, you have. No. No, I mean, I, I, you know, it's not a, the, the new ballet school is not a panacea. Um, well, but but in a sense, you don't accept it. I mean, you would recognize it, but you don't accept it. We we really can't. I mean, I I think that our responsibility is while the children are there, whether or not they're going to be dancers, to make the experience as wonderful, as thrilling, as rigorous as. Uh, uh, engaging as possible um, and then we must move on because life is inexorable in that way um, and we do retain contact with some of the children but we can't I mean we've auditioned uh, uh, I think just under a quarter of a million children um, and had 6,000 children come and study uh, we really don't have the resources to maintain relationships with each of those children Well, I don't know, but I know that when we have a child that no longer uh, 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 is appropriate to study at our school because they don't, they haven't kept up with the class, but they have a passion for dancing, we will try to find another another place where they can study so that they're not just cut off and that their needs are addressed. Are there any other questions? All right, I think we can stop. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. <laughs> Certainly, I thought you were David Sestine. I don't know. <laughs> of his of the style, he was a poet, and that made the difference. Let me just let me just explain. That's why Eric liked him for four years so much because he was a poet. Uh, um, after my years with Balanchine, then I started out to be a modern dancer. I think the first book I ever wrote, or ever read, on was Isidore Duncan's *The Art of the Dance*. I never knew. I didn't know there was until that winter. I didn't know there was such a thing as dancing on the stage. <laughs> in Kansas City, a dance company no, never came. No, in New came? York. In New York, and uh, Isidora. Balanchine, he was a very wonderful man, but I knew in my heart that we had to go on. Mm -hmm. uh, because well, he was dealing with centuries of academic yes. uh, but also discipline, was, yeah. and you wanted something fresher. Yes. And also the role of the man. After all, historically, the ballet grew up. He said ballet is woman. 
And so the man was always lifting this beautiful creature up. And uh, who did become a metaphor, in yes, fact. Yes, of course, of course, no. But, but, but there wasn't quite that equalness. Well, anyway, the, apropos of your question, I'm just thinking uh, we had to go on. And so that's what I've, I've engaged my life to do. Are there any other questions? Yes. Right, in the second row here first, and then Lillian. Yeah, I want to say one thing. First of all, um, I, the, the first um, opening of the book, the, uh, the prologue has the most, to me, the most profound statement on time and the dance that I've ever read in terms of, uh, you should read it because I don't remember exactly, but it's something along the lines of experiencing time in its most profound um, division or something. Moment, you mean this book? Yeah, mo moment by moment. Yeah, well, that's that wonderful. I, I don't know if I can find. Yes, this is uh, Eric's words on time, experiencing time moment by moment. Um, right, first page, like the paragraph, oh well. <laughs> <laughs> I believe I believe in the possibility of a choreography of such immediacy that time could be sensed in its most difficult and yet most haunting dimension. Time sensed instant by instant, a kind of time freed from space. Yes. Is that it? Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I really feel like I can uh, live by that in terms of even doing things like contact improv, which you know, may not be necessarily in your genre, but I use it, I quote it to my students when I teach that. But yeah. actually, my question, I just wanted to say that you can let me because it's a great quote, but um, my question is actually about your process between the two of you. Since you work together on so many different projects, do you often take different approaches, do you sometimes present some kind of musical idea to, to him, or is it a, a pretty standard format, or is it, you know, how is the actual interaction of the uh, process? Well, let me just say for the tape that the question is about how the collaboration between Eric Hawkins and Lucid Lukashevsky proceeds on a practical level. And has it changed? Well, there are three possibilities uh, for anybody, um, music and dance. Uh, first of all, there's the idea, are you going to make them equal, or is one going to be subservient to the other? And I think just on the side of morality, they have to be equal. <laughs> just they have to be equal. Uh, some of you who, who have degrees in dance probably have had inflicted on you uh, books by uh, Suzanne, oh, what's her name? Langer. Suzanne Langer, yeah, who was a, a brilliant woman in um, symbolic logic, but she also played the piano and taught at Connecticut College where there was a dance thing and decided that she was going to be an aesthetician as well. And in it, she said that uh, it is possible to uh, have a beautiful dance to, a, to an indifferent piece of music. And then Clive Barnes, a lot of people have decided that that's all right. Well, that cotton in the ears, the idea is that if you're going to have an indifferent piece of music, for me, because my ears are always open unless I put earplugs in them, when I go to the supermarket and all that music, I always put earplugs in so I, can't, I don't hear. But uh, when I go to a dance concert, my ears are very open. And if I see something beautiful on the stage and then hear this, this boring rattling around, uh, either on the tape or mostly it's on the tape, it tears down the beauty of the dance for me. So I think that you can only have a beautiful dance with indifferent music or bad music or if you put earplugs in your ears, then, then you can do that. Lucy, it's impossible. I think one of the uh, uh, parts of this question was, does Eric make the dance and then you make the music? Well, uh, it, that's what, yeah, it? I was, yeah. It, it, so then there are the other possibilities. You can either have the choreographer choreograph in silence and then bring in a composer who will use that choreography as their, as their limit and create a, a score to it, or you can, uh, or a choreographer, which is what usually happens, choreographer shops around and finds a piece of music that's been already written and does a dance to it. You can do it either way. Or a choreographer can commission a composer, as he did with Alan Hovannis, who wrote the music and then, and then Eric choreographed to it. Um, either way is valid. The only problem over and over again is that, as I say, for me, they have to be equal. That means that each 
art form has to have a strong independence of its own. Now, there are choreographers and composers who feel that that's enough, that if they're just independent and, 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 and exist side by side, that's enough. For me, um, I think the added beauty morally, psychologically, as well as aesthetically, is if they sense one another moment by moment. Moment by moment, it's like a good relationship. You sense one another moment by moment, and yet you're independent. And that does not mean that you imitate one another. It does not mean that you, that one dominates the other. It just means that there's a constant sensing moment by moment. And uh, for me, and I think I have done this probably more than any composer that I know, I, I think Eric and I, when we collaborated, we did create a kind of a new art form in the sense that I think that the thrill of hearing that sound while you're seeing that movement and that juxtaposition that is wordless, you don't even know why it's happening, but you put those two together and you get something third, something that's electric in between. I, that kind of sense of poetry I find very, very exciting. And I'm just finishing up now that new score for Eco Places where I'm doing just that. And so that hopefully, if you come in January and here, you will see and hear uh, this kind of two things happening at the same time, affecting one another, maintaining their independence, and creating a third excitement that uh, I, I can't comment on except it thrills me. I think we have maybe one more question. You had a question. Eric, what did you dance in that concert? What did you dance when you danced at the Y here? Stephen Acrobat? No, 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 earlier, no, earlier, earlier than that. Uh, no, I, I had this, I had a composer who, Ralph Gilbert, mm -hmm. who, who wrote my first four, uh, four of my dances. I called it the Liberty Tree. And it was a kind of, it was a kind of social comment, but it wasn't just that. Um, and then I did a piece by Hunter Johnson uh, called Yankee Blue Birches. <laughs> and I don't remember what else I did. But when did you do Trickster Coyote? Oh, yes, yes. Uh, Trickster Coyote was done that. that. With, with a wonderful composer called I, Henry Cowell. Yes. One of the fathers of contemporary American and music. And one of the composers who was very interested in working with dancers. Yes. Absolutely, absolutely. Doris Humphrey. Um, because it's still, it, there is still a strange prejudice. You know, uh, Western music um, developed as much as it did, and Western dance did not develop as much as it did for that very reason about the status of the body, because uh, Western music could, could tell the authorities that it is bodiless, spiritual, it's no more spiritual than any other physical art form, but it doesn't it doesn't paint tables and chairs, so you don't see naive realistic objects. So it's invisible, so therefore it's spiritual. So it could get by getting into the churches, but a physical body, especially if it was being used, that was that was already going into the and so there's still colleges in our country that will not teach dance because I think they call it physical exercise or physical health education or something, but dance is still considered uh, something that is not part of the spirit. Uh, just to finish off the question of how we work, I think it's very important, and we've done this in demonstrations, it'd be fun to do again, where you see the dance in silence, then you hear the music separately, and they're perfect entities in themselves. They really are perfect, and then you bring them together and you get this third wonderful thing happening. So, I think it's getting late, and we should, uh, there's one, oh, there's a desperate question back there. All right, it's, if it's...
Well, they asked, is modern dance, remember George Beiswanger asked, is modern dance dead back in the, in the 40s already? And, and he was thinking that uh, one of the things that was going to happen was that modern dance and ballet were going to join forces, and, and they were both, as we knew them, going to disappear, which didn't happen. So I feel somewhat... Uh, uh, hopeful. I, I think that that there are a lot of people who would rather look at dance than be exposed to ideas about dance. Uh, that um, for me, I always like to go hear people of uh, our leaders talk about what they what they think behind dance. But many people don't want to hear talk; they want to look at, at people moving. I, what do you think, Eric? Why don't is it? Is, do you think there's an audience, a love for modern dance still? Since I came to New York in the 30s from college, I have, I, I, don't, I don't know that I'm, I'm honest in, in saying this or not, but I think there's been a very grave de a deterioration in the whole art scene. You're talking about painting as painting, well? Painting and in dancing. Um, and in composition. <coughs> Look, the New York Times <coughs> is taking seriously pop music. And I think it's beneath our contempt. Well, we need to, we need to, we need <laughs> The human spirit can, you can, because pop music is done, Plato in, in the Republic says, uh, as someone was going from the, one of his characters was going from the Piraeus down by the seashore up to Athens, and he said, I came along where some men who had been hanged were dumped in the ground. And I went over to look at them. I don't know why this is true. But some people choose the, the less good aspect of their life. I don't know why that's true, but some, some people will make a compromise, and so they will do it. They will do something for money, so they they think they can s sell something by doing some dancing that that makes a big hit. Likewise, in the in the music. Uh, so I, I don't. I hate to think this is true, but it looks as though America is on the downhill. Well, I, I have to say something about this. I think, um, I think any culture is, um, is going to stand or fall by all of us who are in it. And I think when we have um, media communication, it, 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 it is a great power, whether we like it or not. And I think we're very, very fortunate to have someone like Deborah because there, when there have been visionary people who have been, who, I'm sure she has an editor who will tell her this, that, and the other, or maybe she doesn't, but whatever. Uh, she has always, she has always opened herself up to a wide spectrum. She hasn't gotten caught into some, some corner, and she has always kind of fearlessly written eloquently over and over and over again. And she helps so much to mold that audience that's going to come. Now, if you think of pop music or pop dance or all, all the pop culture, because it, that is a financial enterprise, primarily, first, um, then so much money is spent on promoting all that that it is very hard for serious artists who are trying for something over and above money to compete with the kind of publicity that, that, say, a big rock concert can get. Now, why in God's name does Madonna do what she does? Because she knows 
that she's going to get a big crowd. She knows she's going to make the money. But there and, is and that, that I don't mean that's her only reason, but that has to be a very important reason. And somehow we need, I was very fortunate in having, I, I was not, one of the reasons I wrote music for dance to this degree was that, that the, the, the official music world thought I was a crazy girl, that, that they weren't going to take any interest in. And Eric uh, thought what I was doing was beautiful. And so it gave me an outlet. So for 10 years, both the downtown crowd and the uptown crowd thought I was a little too crazy. And then after 10 years of working with Eric, Virgil Thompson heard some of my music and began to champion it. And it, it opened it all up in terms of official art. I was very fortunate in another way because I worked for 10 years egolessly because there was no one writing about me, there was no one particularly listening to me, and I was secretly, you know, this underground thing. But uh, the reason I mention this is that Virgil Thompson single-handedly, when he wrote for the Tribune, created a contemporary music culture. And, we, and Leighton is, is very good at that way, but he doesn't have as much, I don't know, uh, power. In any case, it takes those few individuals, once we have something like the media that is so powerful, uh, to, to have a visionary aspect of um, encouraging the audiences to come. Because there's, there's nothing wrong. This lady says, why are there so few? At dance concerts, there are few too. At contemporary music concerts, there are almost none. And then, then the critics will come and say, ah, you see, nobody comes to a contemporary music concert. Well, if, if Madonna or Michael Jackson or whoever were ever publicized the way a typical contemporary music, I, I think there would be one or two people. And so it, it, it's a problem. So and and uh, if, in addition to the media, those of us, I came to New York in the 50s, and it was a wonderful climate of artists, poets, dancers, and we all interrelated. I was, I was made a kind of mascot of the artist club that, that met on 8th Street because I was such a starry-eyed little kid then. And um, so it wasn't only the media. These people also had a visionary enthusiasm. And there are two ladies down there who have been part of that and have been visionary enthusiasts about these concerts. All it takes is all of us supporting this with enthusiasm and the young they'll follow they, 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 we learn that way I think that's I think that's true I, I think I, I know that <coughs> when I have been excited about a beautiful piece of music or something and I tell everyone I know I am already contributing I think each of our individual enthusiasms plus someone like Deborah who's then in a, in a very powerful role as a writer, uh, if we just keep continuing that, it will not die. It will not die. I think on that note, we should end. Thank you all. Thank you. Thanks for listening. For more information on the 92nd Street Y New York and all of our programs, please visit us at 92ny.org.